grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And this is a different sort of Bible study. To my recollection, we've hardly ever, if ever, had a Bible study on Easter Sunday. Usually, we're enjoying the Easter breakfast with each other. But, of course, due to current conditions, that's not possible this year. So since we cannot enjoy the food of the body in each other's company, I wanted to offer some food for the soul, the strength of God's word to continue to build our faith and help us love and serve our neighbors in holy daily living. So we'll be focusing on the first two readings for Easter Sunday. Pastor's sermon talks about the gospel for the day. We're going to look at the first reading, and one of the things we'll talk about is why it's not an Old Testament reading, and the epistle. And the way I'd like to begin is with the concluding collect from this morning's service, which I hope you've been able to listen to or will listen to at messiahgr.org slash worship resources. But we begin with this prayer. Almighty God, you have called your church to witness that in Christ you have reconciled us to yourself. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may proclaim the good news of your salvation, so that all who hear it may receive the gift of salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The focus there, the, the setup for our petition in that collect, is that God has called us to witness, to tell the good news about Jesus to each other, to our families, to our friends, to the people around us in our daily lives. That's true even in this extraordinary situation in which we find ourselves. Uh, Paul says to the congregation, one of his congregations, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and the word of God. So the first readings for the season of Easter generally tend to come from the book of Acts, the book of Act, the Acts of the Apostles, that sequel to the Gospel of St. Luke that focuses on the apostles of Christ, the descent of the Holy Spirit on them and on all the church at the day of Pentecost. They're proclaiming the good news in Jerusalem. They're scattering throughout the known world after the stoning of Stephen and how this worked to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, through Peter, through Paul, through all the other apostles, and so many other disciples. So the lesson that we see today is a lesson about witness and about how God moved Peter to witness to someone who he probably wasn't expecting to encounter. So this comes from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. I do want to kind of review the rest of chapter 10 before we get to the lesson in verse 34. It's necessary context for us. If you have a Lutheran study Bible and you want to follow along, Acts chapter 10 begins on page 1854 in that Lutheran study Bible. So looking at Acts chapter 10, we see a subject we might not have been expecting. Cornelius, a Roman centurion in the town of Caesarea. Now, Caesarea, Caesar's town, obviously not something that the people of Israel had put up. It was a Roman colony. And Roman colonies were often, if you will, retirement villages for Roman soldiers. But Cornelius is an active Roman soldier. So Caesarea may well have been a garrison town as well. Cornelius was known as, according to verse 2 of chapter 10, a devout man who feared God with all his household. That's kind of technical language for saying that Cornelius believed. Cornelius believed in the revelation of the Old Testament to the people of Israel. He believed in one true God. He believed in the promise of a coming Messiah. And he showed that belief through his actions. Verse 2 says that he gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. Maybe you remember the Roman centurion whose servant Jesus healed how the people had said to Jesus, you should do this for this man because he loves us, he has supported us, he's built our synagogue, he gives alms. He is a God-fearing man. And so was Cornelius. 
what Cornelius experienced in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 10 is a vision, an angel of God appearing to him and saying, Cornelius, send to Joppa for a man named Simon Peter. Um, there's a big message that you need to hear that will come from him. And so Cornelius does that. In verses 9 through 23, the focus turns to Peter, who is in Joppa, and he has a vision as well. Cornelius had an angel of God who gave him a message. Looking at chapter 10, verse 9, here's what happens with Peter. He fell into a trance, and he saw the heavens opened, and something descending like a great sheet being led down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. People saw all kinds of anim Peter saw all kinds of animals in that sheet, some of which were probably unclean according to the dietary regulations of the Old Testament. But God says, I've made it clean. It's not common. Go for it. And that vision repeats three times. And if you know your biblical sense of numbers, you know that if something's said three times, it's important, it's urgent, it's a true message from God. So Peter just finishes having this vision, and Cornelius's messengers show up. So the next day, Peter travels back to Caesarea to see Cornelius and his household. And uh, Cornelius has actually called together a whole bunch of people, his close friends and relatives. And Peter starts by saying to them in verse 28, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without hesitation. Peter has learned from God that the gospel is not just for the people of Israel, it's also for the Gentiles. Cornelius has learned from God that Peter has a message that is key, that is core, that will shake his world and change things for him and all his household. And this is where the first reading for Easter Sunday picks up with Acts 10, verses 34 to 43. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. God's message of salvation is going out to all people because he is the God of all the earth. Yes, there are people who reject God. There are people who do not yet know of God, but God is their God too. And what he wants is for his word to be written on the hearts of all who believe. That's why God sends Peter. That's why God sends pastors and teachers. That's why God sends you and me into the world to share his good news. And Peter has had his eyes opened before he opens his mouth. Going on for verses 36 to 38. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, for God was with him. This is common knowledge, but the knowledge is not perfect. It's not exact. And so Peter is saying, I have come to give you the true knowledge about Jesus. Why can he do that? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But notice what Peter said that Jesus did. His ministry was about doing good, about healing all who were under the power of the devil. And right away, Peter proclaims that Jesus Christ is Lord of all kind of a super short creed that many, 
many of the converts to Christianity shared. Because in the Roman world, the password was, Caesar is Lord. But Peter's message is, Jesus is Lord. Therefore, Caesar is not. And here's why we know it. Peter's talked about Jesus doing good and healing. Now he goes on, and he, and he again, unfolds the truth of what Jesus' life and ministry were all about in verses 39 to 41. We are witnesses of all that he did, in the, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So, News has spread throughout the whole country of Israel, possibly through more of the Roman world yet, about Jesus' life and ministry, and about how Jesus, in spite of being this anointed one, this person who has the Holy Spirit and power, it doesn't make sense that he would be killed, especially killed on a tree by crucifixion, the most shameful death that there was, that the Roman government could administer. Jesus' condemnation on the cross came from the perspective of earthly powers, despite God's anointing, the powers of the Holy Spirit, and his gracious healing. He was despised and rejected of men, as we heard on Good Friday. But this was the mission. Because of Jesus' condemnation, we are freed from the condemnation of sin. And his death on a tree undoes what happened with the tree of knowledge of good and evil back in the Garden of Eden. Eve's willful reach for Eden's tree was cured by Christ's willingness to die on the cross for us. But notice what Peter emphasizes two times. This is the real thing. This is the straight dope. This is what happened. Because we, me and the rest of the apostles, we are eyewitnesses of everything that he did and of everything that happened. What's even more amazing, we are witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. We'll be hearing more about that in the Gospels for the Sunday after Easter, with Jesus' appearance to the disciples in the upper room, to Jesus' appearance to the disciples at Emmaus. But Peter says, I was there. I know what happened. This is most certainly true. And then we go on to verses 42 and 43. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Notice how Peter has brought Cornelius and his followers along. He started with what they know, the news of Jesus' miraculous ministry and of Jesus' horrific death. But he's used his status and his knowledge and the truth he shares as an eyewitness to bring home the most important, most powerful reality, that Jesus' death was not for nothing. It was for us. That he rose again. So we will rise again too. And that he is the one who will come again to judge the living and the dead. There's an interesting Luther quote in the Lutheran Study Bible. Who will harm a person when the great God and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom the day of judgment belongs, is on their side and stands before them with all his glory, greatness, majesty, and might? Peter's confidence in proclaiming the gospel of Cornelius and his household is not just because he had this vision that said he could do it. It is because he knows that Christ has ascended into heaven, that he is ruling the world on behalf of his church, and that he will return again at the end of days. And notice the final words that he said, shares with Cornelius. That all the prophets of the Old Testament that great revelation of God that Cornelius already believes. All the prophets bear witness 
that everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins, as, long, as well as life everlasting. And at that point, Cornelius and his household manifest the signs of the Holy Spirit, and Peter says, let's baptize these folks. And that's how it works with adults. Um, we hear the word, we believe it. If we have not yet been baptized, then we are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we said last week, that baptism, that being incorporated into Christ's death and resurrection through water and the word is such a key part of so many texts. Uh, we talked about that on Palm Sunday with the servant of the Lord. And we talk about it here, and we're also going to talk about it in our second reading. And that is in the epistle to the Colossians. If you're in the Lutheran Study Bible, uh, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 2 and 3. Chapter 3 is the re verses 1 to 4 is the reading for Easter Sunday. But uh, we need, again, we need to retrace and tackle some background as well. Paul is writing to this church in Colossae, another Roman city. And again, he's trying to encourage them to remain in the faith, to love and serve each other, and to not be fooled by false teachers. There are apparently some false teachers in Colossae who are imparting what they consider a secret knowledge. Uh, this was a very typical tactic of many religions in the Roman world. It's like, okay, you've heard the myths about Jesus or Mithras or whoever, but we've got the inside knowledge and we know the rest of the story. But unlike Peter, that knowledge wasn't based on eyewitness accounts. It was based on something a little bit squirrelier, something that, as it developed over the centuries, the fathers of the church called Gnosticism, the whole idea of a secret knowledge that was only revealed to the really special people. Against that, the apostles in the church always preached that God has revealed everything that we need to know in the gospel of Jesus. And that's what Paul is talking about in Colossians 2 and 3. This is on page 2045 in your Lutheran Study Bible. We're going to start with verse 8. And we're going to read verses 8 through 10. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity, of Godhead, dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and all authority. Paul says, don't let anyone fool you with philosophy and with empty deceit. Philosophy can help us. The knowledge of our human reason is good, and we need to use it in matters of this world in that left-hand kingdom of God's rule. But philosophy is powerless to let people know, to explain who God is and what he's about. That can only be revealed to us. We cannot figure it out by ourselves. We use reason as a servant to be good stewards of the world that God has given us. But if we use reason to try to figure out God, we are going to go terribly, terribly wrong. And these false teachers had done that already. Paul talks about two parts of the, these false teachers' empty deceit. Uh, it's according to human tradition. Notice, he's not talking about the tradition of the scripture handed on over the centuries. And that's what tradition needs, to pass on, to hand forward to the next generation. He's talking about human reason trying to figure God out, and that becomes human tradition. That's one of the things he's warning them against. The other things he's warning them against is the elemental spirits of the world. And we don't know exactly what he was talking about. Um, it could have been, again, that people tried to use their reason and construct a picture of the spiritual world, which human reason can't understand, from what they saw around them from the creation, from the basic elements of the fallen universe. 
it is true that in Colossians, um, those elemental spirits often seem to refer to fallen angels. So it could well even be that these false teachers are under demonic control, taking revelations from fallen angels as the truth about God. So Paul's warning the Colossians away from that. Because in Christ, the whole fullness of the deity of the Godhead dwells bodily. These Gnostic teachers were very big on fullness, on how most people only got a little bit of the picture, but God would fill you up with at least a little bit of his secret knowledge. Um, that Gnostic worldview there, cosmology, their picture of the gods and godlets and demons and angels in the universe was full of these pseudo-divine beings that supposedly emanated from God and then they went the wrong way. Paul says you don't need any of that. In Christ, Christ is fully God and fully man. And you have everything of him from him. When we rely on the gospel of Jesus Christ, God fills us completely with everything we need to support this body and life, to strengthen us in our faith, to love and serve others. And Paul goes on about what that fullness consists of and how it comes to us in verses 11 through 15. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision not made by hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And isn't that amazing how Paul echoes Peter? We've been buried with Christ in baptism. We're raised from the dead with him in baptism, this new circumcision. And while the adults in the first reading were the ones that were baptized, it's interesting that Paul ties baptism to circumcision, which was hap happened on the eighth day of a, of a man's life. Before they could choose, God chose them through the covenant of circumcision. And now, before we can choose, at least by our reason or the lights of how we think, infants think, God chooses them and us through baptism. Verses 13 to 15. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Again, that picture of Jesus joyfully bearing our burden by dying for our sins. Verse 15 is really even more core. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Like he does in Ephesians, Paul says all of us are spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins because of our fallen nature. We are separated from God even though he created us and we bear his image. But this baptism, this incorporation of us into Christ, connects us with Jesus' life and death and being made alive together with him. And notice what happens. He forgives us all our trespasses. He cancels the record of debt. Jesus' words on the cross, it is finished, tetelestai in the Greek. That meant paid in full. That's what the bill collector stamped on the bill when you paid it in full. And Jesus had paid our debt of sin in full so that we do not fear death and we know we rise to eternal life. In fact, he nailed our debt and our sin to the cross, and it's gone now. God looks at us. He doesn't see it. He sees Jesus. Verse 15 ties in with what Paul was warning against back in verse 8. Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities. And those rulers and authorities could be many things. They are created things. We know that. Um, often corrupted by sin. They could be fallen angels. They could be impersonal things, 
like our educational institutions, our economic systems, our governments. Certainly, there was pressure in the Roman system for everyone to conform to the Romans' way of thinking, their way of life, and their religious beliefs, including the one that Caesar was Lord. But Paul says Christ has triumphed over all of them. And that's a technical term. Uh, a triumph was when Roman soldiers, Roman armies, returned to Rome with the spoils of their conquest, which frequently included the defeated generals, defeated armies, and they weren't just kept in prison and left to rot. They had to walk through the whole city of Rome. And you can imagine that things were thrown on them that probably weren't confetti. As Christ did when he descended into hell before his resurrection, that was a victory parade. That was for him to say, Satan, you've lost. I've won. We can be confident that whatever rulers and authorities, demonic, worldly, whatever, are making difficulties for us, are, strugg are struggling against us. Christ has already triumphed over all of them. All our sins have been nailed to the cross, and they cannot harm us. Not now, not forever. All this plays into the actual second reading, which is Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, and according to chapter 2, we have, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. It doesn't mean we're looking up in the sky. It means, spiritually, we look to those higher things, those things in heaven, beyond our, our universe, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And again, he's seated there to intercede for us, to rule over the world for the benefit of his people. Set your minds on things that are above not on the things of earth. That's hard for us under normal circumstances. It may be even harder now. We may be fretting and fuming about any number of things, about are we going to have enough money to make us through? We may have seen our quarterly statements for our investments and said, oh man, um, we may wonder how much longer we have to stay in this defensive posture against coronavirus. But notice what Paul says. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things of the earth. All the things that we worry about will pass. And as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, by worrying about them, we cannot add one hour to our life. We can't make ourselves any taller by worrying about them. In fact, we are called to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things are granted to us as well. That's why we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And maybe why, in the circumstances we're in now, that petition of the Lord's Prayer is more resonant than it's ever been before. But why should we do all this? Why should we just kind of pull our eyes up from the fretting and fuming and fussing and worrying of daily life here and set our minds on things above. For you have died. Again, through baptism, we have already died to all of this. It doesn't feel like it because we're going through it. But none of this. If the worst happens, it cannot harm us. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Our real life has already begun. But we don't see it easily. We see it through a glass darkly. It's hidden with Christ in God. Our true life is in heaven. And when Christ, who is your hope, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. That's one of the messages we can never repeat too often on this Easter Sunday or during this Easter season. Because if our life is hidden with Christ in God, the best is yet to come. We will be raised with him. Our bodies will be as they were intended to be before the fall. Life in the new heaven and the new earth will be as it was intended to be in paradise before sin corrupted us. We will appear with him in glory. 
whatever our circumstances in this life, no matter how hard pressed and trodden down we may feel or even may be, we have this already. And we have it already because we know that Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ will come again. These are the promises we hold on to. It's the promise that Peter believed. It's the promise that Peter shared with Cornelius in his household and they believed. It's the promise that Paul believed. It's the promise that Paul shared with the Colossians and by the power of the Holy Spirit working through his word, they believed. And it's the same promise that we believe today. When we hear and read God's word and the Spirit works that faith in our heart, like the oxygen we need every day to breathe, the word of God helps us breathe spiritually so we can exhale as well in good works to our family and friends and our loved ones and those around us. And we can exhale it in prayer. And that's what I'd like to conclude with. A prayer that is actually a verse of one of the hymns from Easter Sunday. Now all the vault of heaven resounds. It's actually based on this epistle lesson. And the third stanza is the one that I would like to pray as a close. O oh, fill us, Lord, with dauntless love. Set heart and will on things above, that we conquer through your triumph. Grant grace sufficient for life's day, that by our lives we truly say, Christ has triumphed. He is living. Alleluia. May God's grace be with you all. May Christ's triumph give us strength and courage to continue our lives in this extraordinary time, not fearing, not worrying, but trusting that he is working for us and he will bring us through. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you on this Easter Sunday and always. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.